just like Pono said, it's the year of Linux on the desktop. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Oh my god, I am so excited to see everybody like real in person, like see your faces at a real conference. My goodness. My name's Emily Schaefer. Uh, I lead the Git core team at Google, so that means that, I'll, I'll talk about it in the next slide. Um, but that mostly means that we hack on Git upstream, the Git client that we all know and probably love, I hope. Uh, lately, we've been doing a lot of work developing the user experience around Git's submodules feature. So today I'm going to share a little bit of context on that work, a little bit of the vision that we're hoping to achieve, and a little bit of an update on the progress that we've made so far. Uh, and just as an FYI, I've got the link to the slides down in the corner here. There's some extra details in the speaker notes on some of the thornier slides, so you can feel free to pop open your laptop, pop open the slides, have a look. Um, or if you're having trouble you know, understanding me or anything, literally I'm reading from the speaker notes, so just open the speaker notes and you'll know everything I'm gonna say. Okay, so let me introduce myself a little bit further. Uh, I've been at Google for like six years. I just had my six year Googleversary like last two, two weeks ago. Uh, and I've been working on the Git core team for like three years. This year, I, actually, I just became the lead for that team, so this is very scary for me. <laughs> the Git core team means that we work on the Git client, uh, upstream, full time, modulo, whatever kind of releasing overhead that we might have. And since I've joined, we've been primarily focused on making Git work uh, with huge repositories, so Git at scale. And in a past life, I was a firmware hacker. I used to co-maintain part of OpenBMC, if anybody has heard of it. Uh, and I've, I've reformed since then. Uh, but I really haven't let go of like some other things, like my deep love of regular expressions and so on. Uh, I love regular expressions, really. Uh, and of course, just, you know, every, everything's better with dog pictures. So here's an obligatory photo of Crash Override. He's my dog. He's the best dog. He's very good. Okay, so what is a submodule? We might not uh, all be familiar with the term, so I'll try and explain. The submodule is the Git term for referencing one repository inside of another repository. It's really handy for source dependencies. So you could imagine a project that you're actively developing independently from your own project. Uh, and you need the source code for that. Having your dependencies built as part of the rest of the source tree, like really you just have the code right here, it might kind of sound like a pain, but it's actually really helpful if you're looking for repeatable and bisectable builds, and it kind of helps you avoid some other supply chain attacks, like you might think like log4j or something. Uh, we also use it at Google for performance reasons. So we have some very, 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 very large projects which kind of break Git with the sheer number of objects. You saw the folks just in the section before this. I don't know if anybody's ever opened the Android source tree. It's big. <laughs> uh, so in those cases, we might want to split some parts of the project out. So for example, uh, a really simple example you could think is some like non-code assets that are associated with a really specific version of some project. So you could think like the Android startup movie that plays when you in install, uh, is it 12? Android 12 is the most recent, something like that. So, uh, so now we know what submodules are. Maybe we can talk a little bit about how they work. So I'm gonna start with the basics, which has nothing to do with submodules, actually. It's a single repository Git project. Most of you are probably familiar with this, I really hope, especially after this morning. So we've got the Git directory. This contains all of the machinery for Git. Um, and then at some given commit, we've got the work tree, and this is filled with some like files and directories. And in the object store, those files and directories are represented as blobs and trees. And each of these blobs and trees have their own ID, and the ID is used eventually to compute the commit ID. So all of this should be kind of familiar to us. This is how Git works. So we can have a look at submodules. Um, the basic concept, like I said, is that we're nesting a Git repository inside of another Git repository. And we'll talk about the super project, which is the repository that contains other repositories. And then these other repositories, which are being contained, we'll refer to as submodules. So we can take a look first at the file system. And we can see that uh, inside of our super project's Git directory, we have a couple of other Git directories. So each of these will contain the machinery for their, their specific submodule. And inside of the work tree, we've got uh, two brand new directories here. We've got sub1 and sub2. So these are actually the submodule's work trees. And inside of these submodules, we can see that it looks pretty much like any other Git project. So there's like 
a .git file, there's some files and directories making up the work tree, it looks like pretty normal. One thing that I'll note is the, the, the .git here, it's actually a file that contains a path. It's not a full git directory. Um, the path in that file is the path to the git directory that's up in the super project's git directory. Uh, this kind of like using the git, the .git file rather than the .git directory is familiar for people who might have used like git work tree. If you haven't used git work tree, you should use it. It's freaking great. Um, okay, so it's basically a pointer to the actual git directory and like I said, that lives inside the super project's git directory. And finally, we've got this .git modules thing. So this thing contains some metadata that you need to generate the submodules git directories at clone time. So it's got like the remote URL, the tracking branch, the name, stuff like this. You would update the git modules file probably about the same time that you would update like a make file. So like when you add a new source dependency to your project, for example. Ooh. So we can also see how these are represented by objects. We've got these two special things, sub one and sub two. So these are called git links. So that basically means it's not just a tree, like, uh, like the source directory will be represented as a tree. It's actually a full git repository and we're referring to it by the, cur <clears throat> the currently checked out commit ID. So we're not using the computed tree ID, we're using the full commit ID, so that means it's got the author data and history and blah, 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 blah. Um, so you can think of it basically like a pointer. It's a pointer to a commit in the submodule project. These submodules are independent projects from the super project, and each one has its own commit graph, object store, and so on. And development in the submodule can happen totally separately. The super project's pointer to it just kind of gets updated whenever it makes sense. So the super project does not track the tip of the submodule branch. That's important. And submodules, they're not necessarily for everything. They're not great for every single workflow. So there's a few cases where they're not really a good idea. So for example, if you always wanna take the latest from a dependency, they might not really be for you. So in this case, you know that you're always gonna be taking the bleeding edge, and you don't care if you use a different version of your dependency when you're bisecting against older code. Uh, so probably in this case, you would really just wanna use a package manager. The automation that you would need to follow the tip of your submodule all the time like this is gonna cause a lot of noise and clutter in your super project, and it's gonna inflate your commit count pretty quickly. And indeed, if you don't need bisect at all, or if you do and your dependencies don't change often enough that you really are worried about repeatable builds, it still might not be for you. So even if you are keeping up with the bleeding edge of your dependency, if you really don't care what version it is, like maybe it's very stable or you're using some old feature that hasn't been touched in like a decade, then probably, again, you should just use a package manager instead of grabbing the source. So submodules really shine when you're trying to make your full build repeatable and auditable. And finally, if your submodule really doesn't mean anything by itself, so in this case, you're like probably trying to have like a perfect monorepo and you're just using the submodules for performance sharding, right? So they can work this way, but they actually provide a lot of additional flexibility beyond what a monorepo would provide, and that extra flexibility can be a pitfall. Uh, so you should probably proceed with caution, make sure that uh, some other Git scaling solution isn't a better solution for you. So stuff like partial clones, CDN offloading, sparse checkout, et cetera, some of the other great stuff that we saw earlier today. Okay, submodules have been part of Git since 2007, holy cow, but they're not super popular. Um, so maybe we can talk about what it's like to use them right now. So most of the time, we interact with submodules today by using this git submodule command. It does a lot of different things that can help manage the lifetime of your submodules. So we'll just go down the list here. Git submodule add is used to create a brand new git link in your project. So this takes the remote URL for another repository uh, that you're trying to make part of your super project. And it's only used once during the lifespan of your submodule. It's kind of vaguely similar to git add because the git link is staged after you run it and the changes to the git modules file are staged, but it doesn't actually populate the contents of your new submodules work tree. So although you've got some of the stuff that you need there, if you try and like CD into your submodule and see what's going on, it's, it's empty, there's nothing there. Git submodule init is used to create git links for submodules which are present in the index 
but they're not in the work tree yet. So when you're cloning a project, if you are cloning and it's got submodules, it's not really going to tell you that it has submodules. You have to run git submodule init to see that. This is absolutely dissimilar from git init. It doesn't do the same thing at all. Git submodule sync synchronizes the remote URL that's specified in the git modules file to whatever is specified in the submodules git dir for a remote URL. So basically, if you used to pull from github.com slash some project, and you decide, OK, I'm going to mirror instead, I'm going to use this mirror at git.kernel.org slash some project, then you would use this command to teach the submodule the new URL. Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with the tool called Repo that's used for Android development. If anybody's got some hands, a few people. You know Repo Sync? This is not like Repo Sync. This doesn't do the same thing as Repo Sync at all. Totally different. Uh, so git submodule update, that is kind of like it, uh, is used to set the submodule's current commit to the one that's referenced in the super project. So sometimes this results in a simple git checkout in the submodule, but sometimes we have to do a git fetch first if the submodule is missing the commit that the super project thinks it should have. Yes, you have to run this manually. Simply checking out another commit from the super project doesn't automatically check out the corresponding commit in each submodule. This command also will clone submodules which were newly added, so it's really easy to forget to run it when you're checking out a commit with you know, some new submodule that showed up in the, the recent history. There's a ton more of these git submodule subcommands, but the last one that I wanted to touch on is called git submodule for each, which is uh, pretty much the same thing as like xargs. If anybody's used xargs, it runs the command that's you provided in the context of each submodule. It doesn't assume that it's a git command. Um, and so that means that you end up with really nice, understandable invocations like git submodule for each git checkout foo. Totally concise. <laughs> So with these commands, users have to think all the time about the fact that they're using submodules. They have to manage their submodules by hand every step of the way. And failing to understand what these commands do and when to use them can lead to some really confusing consequences. So we can take this example from the Garrett project, which is near and dear to me and uses a bunch of submodules. I'm going to check out an older commit here. But just from a checkout, you know, I had a, I had a clean, clean worksheet before. I'm going to run git checkout. Oh my god, why do I have all these modified files? What is happening? So all of these files are actually git links. And git is trying to tell me that when I checked out commit b556, my submodules didn't come along. So they're all still pointing to whatever was at tip before. And to be fair, if I had run git checkout dash recurse submodules, the submodules would have come along with me. But it's really easy to forget to do that. So let's look a little bit closer at the situation that we've gotten ourselves into. When I run git status, I've got all of this modified junk here. These are the submodules, and so they're, they're modified because they're pointing at the wrong place. OK, well, this is, this is easy. This is an easy one. I know how to get rid of junk. I'm going to use my favorite hammer, git reset dash hard. I love it. I use it all the time. Totally fine. So this should have made my work tree perfect and sparkling and perfectly clean, right? Ah, no. I guess not. So, it didn't do anything because the submodules need to be synchronized to the super project commit. We might remember from the previous slide that that one's git submodule update. And because I ran git reset hard without recurse submodules, it looked just at the super project work tree and it said, oh, there's nothing to do here. This is great. It didn't do anything. This kind of con confusing situation can happen like all the time with the current state of submodules. So that means, really, we've kind of got a set of commands which can do anything that we might want to do, provided we know exactly how to use them. And based on, you know, I know people watched Jacob's talk this morning, so we kind of understand that's how Git started out, too, back in 2005. But we've come a really long way since then. I, I know not everybody might call Git usable, uh, but using Git's porcelain interface, sure, <laughs> it's a heck of a lot better than using the plumbing commands directly. So let me say a little bit more. Um, like I said, this was touched on from Jacob's talk this morning. Git has two classes of commands. We've got the plumbing commands, and we've got the porcelain commands. These porcelain commands, these are the ones that we use every day, like git add, git status, git push, so on. They do lots of different kind of things in a single command, depending on the option. I'm looking at you, git checkout. You do too much. Uh, but they're like pretty easy to remember. You know, 
But many of these commands actually call lots of other smaller commands. And these other commands tend to follow like the Unix philosophy that we should do only one thing and we should do it really well. So that's commands like git hash object, which computes the hash of an object. Shocking. There's tons of these. And you too could use your git repository by calling just these plumbing commands if you wanted to. There's actually some details on how you can do that in the pro git book, which is great and you should read it and it's free. But it's complicated to do that, and they're, they're designed for like scripts and porcelain commands to be using them, not for humans to use them. So git submodules commands, they're like kind of the same thing. And since we came that far from, you know, from git itself to having some nice git, plumbing, or git, git porcelain commands, I feel like we still have some hope for submodules too. Submodules by nature, they're always gonna be complex. Recursion is always complex, but we think that we can at least make them like predictable. So let's talk about how. Many of us might be familiar with the merge commit as the unit of review. So some developer might make a handful of changes in their own, or on their own in separate commits. And when they ask for a review, the entire topic branch is reviewed all at once, and later it's gonna be merged all at once. Uh, so this is the primary GitHub model, pull requests or GitLab calls it merge requests. And often when we do merge, sometimes we'll like, we'll squash it all together. So you really just have like one commit. Uh, we don't really see all of these little things, but whatever. So we know that all of these individual commits exist, but when they're taken out of context with each other, they don't really make a lot of sense by themselves. The topic as a whole is what's interesting to review. With submodules, it's actually pretty similar. So a feature might require commits in a handful of submodules, and the super project commit that encompasses the full set of commits, uh, sorry, the super project commit does encompass the full set of commits that are required to complete the task. So in this example, we're gonna add a new feature. So we're gonna add a new button, we make some style changes to draw it, we give it something to do over then the action submodule, and almost immediately we realize we have a bug. It's gonna require a fix in the action layer, and we're gonna put a regression test over in the view layer. And I just wanna say, um, this is an example. I'm a C developer. Uh, my UI experience is like 10 years old, so if this doesn't make sense, just play along, just pretend. <laughs> uh, so just like with a merge commit, we're representing the full change to the super project in a single commit. But since we're picking up changes not from a topic branch, but from a submodule, we're gonna use a regular commit that includes git link changes, not a typical merge commit. And by the way, if we had noticed this bug independently in the view or the action submodule before the original super project commit was pushed, we could have just waited. We could have waited until the bug was fixed to even pick up changes in the first place. We don't have to point the super project to new commits until we're absolutely ready to do so. So with that guiding concept in mind, that we can treat the super project commit kind of like a merge commit, we can start to be a little bit more opinionated about the workflow. The reason that git submodule XYZ is hard to use is because although you can do anything with it, git doesn't actually do any of that stuff for you. But now that we're pretty sure we know what a good look workflow looks like, we can start to have git recurse implicitly in a predictable way. So for example, when we clone and ask, the sub ask for the submodules once, we can assume that we want to continue working with those submodules by default. And this is actually possible today, provided that you have this submodule.sticky recursive clone config set to true in your global, uh, global config or system config. So because we're now implicitly recursing after cloning this way, I will be able to leave off the dash recurse submodules flag from the rest of the commands that I'm gonna run through or you know, talk through in the rest of the, the talk. And some people who have used submodules before might be familiar with git placing all of your submodules into detached head mode by default after you do you know, git submodule update or something. And instead of doing that, we can just point the default branch of, in the submodules to the commit that's pointed to by the super project. When we're changing branches, we can ensure that the entire work tree matches the state that the super project commit thinks it should when we're trying to check out. So presumably, we're gonna wanna do some hacking after we change, so we're gonna make sure that the submodules also have a branch of that name set up and pointing to the right commit. And in some cases, this might actually be different from the commit at the remote branch of the same name. We want your work tree to be clean after a fresh checkout, and we want it to match the state that the super project thinks it should have. 
So if necessary, we're going to point the local branch to something that may or may not be different from what the branch of the same name points to upstream. And as we hack in the submodules, we're going to keep committing as we go. Uh, and the super project is left with a dirty work tree because the git link has changed. So before we switch away from this branch, we need to, you know, just like with a, with a single repository, we need to get rid of the dirty work tree. We need to make some commit in the super project so that we can keep track of that change. During fetch, over the course of the super project history, we might have added some additional submodules. Um, so in this example, we can assume that your origin main is pointed at this v2.0. So let's say that after you fetched, somebody added a new source dependency upstream. We should clone that submodule when we're fetching again in your local copy so that the newly added submodule will just work. And in some cases, the submodule might have been added and then removed again later on. We should clone it anyways, uh, and that's specifically so that when we're bisecting or moving around in history, that submodule will work. I'm like psyched that so many people talked about bisect earlier today, by the way, like, good, bisect is rad. Okay, rebasing is a little bit trickier. We already are not super great at re rebasing merges in Git, but we're proposing to rebase these super project commits, which we've previously stated are like really similar to merge commits. So maybe, hmm, I don't know. So let's take a look at how an interactive rebase might work. We can be careful as we replay every super project commit, and we can only replay the submodule commits that were introduced by that super project commit. The super project commit will have to be regenerated at every set of submodule commits because the git links will be different after they've done their own rebase. And by the way, even though I've shown it for an interactive rebase here, this is also the kind of thing that we would do for like git pull dash r. Git push is easy though. Uh, we really only have one thing we're worried about for git push. We want to just make sure that any submodules that we're pushing uh, before the super project, uh, we want to make sure they make it in before the super project commit makes it in, and that's so that we don't confuse any CI that might try and pull the brand new super project commit and immediately do something with it. So I've drawn a picture here of the bad state where the super project commit is upstream, the submodule commit is not pushed all the way yet. If we try to fetch and build from here, like. I don't know, what's this hash here? This is, who knows what's going on. So instead, uh, sorry, the submodule's heads being advanced don't actually have any effect on cloners of the super project uh, until the super project commit that points to those new commits makes it all the way through. So instead, we're just gonna make sure that the submodule commit makes it all the way to the server and is fully accepted before we push or accept the super project commit. And in the future, some review platforms like maybe like Garrett could even use the super project commit itself it, with everything in an un, you know, unaccepted state uh, to synchronize pushes across multiple super submodule remotes. And I really hope that nobody from the Garrett team came to this and hears me like making promises for them. <laughs> so that's just a taste of the plans for the workflow. So I'm gonna include a link to the full design doc at the end of the presentation. You can open up the slides and take a look at it if you want. But for now, I wanted to take a look at what we've done so far. It's a really big project. We want to make sure that we don't build the whole thing and discover that it's totally unusable. So we're using a handful of small implementation stages. And at each stage, we're working with testers inside of Google to find out whether or not it's working for them. But in all cases, actually, even though we're testing with Googlers, they're just handy. They just live near us. Um, all of our testers are going to be using Git that's primarily from the next branch upstream. So that means that anybody could use these workflows, even you. It's still early days. Like I said, we're still working on the basics. So right now we're working on ideally allowing somebody to make like a one-time drive-by, take it or leave it change with no intention of iterating during review or working further on the project afterwards. Maybe you like find a typo in some doc that you're referring to. It doesn't sound like much, but it actually gives us a good enough start to get a little bit of user feedback, so for now, it's enough. Folks might have seen some related changes making it into Git lately, mostly gated behind configs. So we have some things like enabling clone-recurse submodules to turn on recursion by default, which I mentioned a little earlier, uh, allowing branches to inherit the tracking information from the branch that they forked from. This is really useful for making Git push uh, so that we don't have to like provide a bunch of options to Git push. 
And there's some changes that are still in progress. So we're still working on teaching submodules how to understand that they are submodules, and then using that info to share some config between the submodules and the super project. And some parallelization changes uh, that we're trying to make the submodules performant enough for really large repositories, like I said, Android is huge, whose users that we're working with. Usually the performance stuff should come at the end, but in this case it's necessary to even be able to try out the workflow in the first place. Nobody wants a workflow where the initial clone takes like four hours or more. Does it sound exciting to you? Are you like, I know it's complex, but like, are you jazzed anyway? Do you want to help? Do you want to test? Do you want to hack? Do you want to do anything? Uh, I have some links in the slides here. You can do a little bit of reading and get up to speed. You can chat with any of me or my team during the bi-weekly IRC standups on Libera chat. So I listed the channel and the handles for my team. We're not super good at being on IRC all the time, but we're definitely there in the scheduled standups every other week. And you would be welcome, of course, to come and join, contribute, poke holes in the workflow, review code, write patches, change documentation, write blog posts, anything. Anything helps. Everything helps. And if there's any questions, I think I have a couple of minutes to answer them. So you can just stick your hand up. And also, at the, at the slide URL, uh, everybody should have comments enabled. So if you want to ask questions in line, you can totally just type a question. And I'll try to answer until my laptop dies. Any questions live? This is all really cool work. Um, I was wondering, uh, considering submodule UX, one of the things that would be really nice for projects that use submodules is if you had a fluent way to act upon submodules. So, for instance, when you're looking at status, if it could recurse into the actual submodules to some extent and allow you to add files like from a top level instead of having to operate in every particular Git directory. I know that this is really complicated, but has any thought been given to those kinds of things? So you're asking like Git status showing you the state of yeah, the individual instance, files like, inside right. of the submodule? Instead of just saying that it's a Git link, yeah. actually showing you the index state in that actual work tree, right? Uh, yeah, I, I think that's one of the later changes that we have considered for yeah. Git status. It's a little bit um, exciting and fun to implement because I think we get to do some, some like hook out and like call status in each submodule or something. I, I'm not sure. It'll be fun. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we have something like that in the design doc, but it's been a while since I looked there, so please feel free to take a look. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, yeah, what about if your submodule is behind the protected branch? You can't push it directly before pushing the um, outer repository. You're asking how do we prevent pushes in the super project before we're pushing the submodule branch? Is yeah, if right? you try to push the super project and it tries to push the submodule first, but you can't push the submodule because um, it's on the main branch and the main branch is protected, so you need to close up a pull request there first. Yeah, um, so hmm, in the pull request workflow, so I'm going to be honest, we did mostly design it around the Garrett workflow, so let me think for a second. I think you would be pushing to your own fork in both, if that's correct. So I think as long as the submodule commit is present in your fork of the submodule, then the super project commit should be able to push to your fork of the super project. But that's a really good point that we should think about how to set up this like alternate multi-remote thing. I think the multi-remote stuff is planned for like mid next year because like I said, we're, we're working on Garrett first and Garrett has different magic than how GitHub has. Okay. I don't know if we have more time. My timer says I have 30 seconds, but I don't know if we are still going or not. Okay, I think we're all set. Thanks everybody. Like I said, you can ask questions in the, in the slides also. Thank you.